let's be honest, these are the four biggest chemicals in our brain that drive us forward. Mm. Um, serotonin is released when we perform an act of kindness or, and this is the wonderful part, witness an act of kindness. Hello and welcome to Shared.Care's What is Manly radio show and podcast. Men feel more lonely, lost, and not useful in society than ever in history. Males are not attaching to school, work, or women. What it means to be a man appears lost. Is there a framework for being manly that we can unearth? Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care, and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. All right. Hello, Richard. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. And you? Yeah, wonderful. I mean, and I'm loving the environment we live in where we can be across, you know, across continents, still be chatting to each other, discussing ideas, exploring ideas, helping people. I mean, it's it's wonderful. I know it's a tragedy that, you know, it came about through through COVID, but it's nice to be able to to live in this world now where we can connect the way you and I can connect. I I love the technology. This is the good use of the technology. This is the good use of technology. I love that. (laughs) Exactly, because, yeah, we wouldn't be having this conversation otherwise would be my guess. Um, For the audience, who we have is we have Richard Strother. Now, Richard, unfortunately, in October 2018, Richard experienced a life-altering tragedy when he lost his wife of 20 years. And working through his grief, he found the courage to start dating again, which eventually led to a wonderful new relationship. But along the way, he refined the process and methodology for successful dating and testing with several people and seeing amazing results. Now, today, Richard is known as the widower's wingman, kind of a top gun spin there, I think. And he supports fellow widowers through the process of finding healthy, supportive and loving relationships. Now, I love the work that you're doing, Richard. Um, do you want to start, because we're talking about what is manly and and what is reported now that there are a number of men out there in the world that have, you know, they're feeling lost, they're feeling lonely, they're feeling like they don't have a place in society. Um, what have you seen? I mean, you've obviously dealt with men that have gone through some fairly tragic experiences. What have you seen from that perspective of men feeling lost, lonely, and not having a place in society? Well, one of the things that widowers have against them, I mean, look, we could talk, you know, we actually we will talk about some of the things in our society that kind of go against men, but uh, and and just our identities in general. But the fact is, is that widowed uh, widowed men, and this is true of widowed women as well, but widowed men especially, um, when we lose a partner, especially a long term partner, mm. you actually do lose a big part of your identity because we do, as we are in a relationship longer, we establish these roles, and you know, maybe I, if I'm the breadwinner and my wife ran, like in my case, my wife ran the social calendar, and she mm. had her school and whatnot, and you know, because she went back to university. But the the fact is, she managed the social calendar. She was the linchpin for a lot of our friends. It was, you know, a lot of the activities revolved around what she was doing. So when she mm. when she left, you know, uh, mm. not. Not of her own choice, I assure you, but yeah. <laughs> when that happened, of course, then it's though all those rules, not only do all those rules fall on me, mm. and I was fortunate that I had a good identity outside of the relationship, but when your identity almost revolves around your partner, or at least a big part of your life revolves around your partner and you lose that, where do you fit in? Because then all of a sudden you don't even fit in in your own life. 
you have to figure out how you fit in your own life, let alone, you know, the world at large and society at large. And with even before you deal with all the loss, you, you know, even before you can actually really get a chance to grieve, it's usually, yeah, okay, that's fine, but get back to work. And, you know, yes, that can provide a great anchor, but it's still, you know, are you your work? Well, no. <laughs> Yeah, that must be. I mean, it's a difficult thing to to comprehend um, having someone so close to you and and part of your life, then not being there. But as you say, that that's part of you essentially is part of how you operate, um, and that's gone. How does you know someone? I mean, because it'd be very easy to get really lost from that point of view and and not um, have a a view forward. I mean, ha- does that happen where you find, I mean, did that well, happen to you or did you, you know? I was fortunate um, in, in, a, in a number of ways. Uh, one, I was, I was fortunate that um, my late wife, Sam and I lived with, with intention. We were very much about living with intention. <clears throat> so that was a huge, um, a huge thing for us. I did have an identity and a sense of purpose outside of the relationship, <clears throat> even though she had a rare form of cancer and I was caring for her. I understood the the necessity to to exercise self care and to take care of myself properly because if I couldn't be there for me, I certainly couldn't be there for her in any way that she would need. So I was fortunate in that regard. Also, I did have the chance to I understood the medicine very very well. So I I could outline what was happening. Like I could tell you step for step what was happening. So I knew what was going on. And it's not, you know, the, the loss. I had a chance to kind of come to terms with the loss before, you know, it was finalized. I suppose. Mm. <laughs> so in that way, I was quite fortunate in that I had all these things kind of going for me in that respect. But there are a lot of men who don't, and they they lose a sense of purpose. They lose. Um, they lose the person with whom they trust that they can open up to, that they can tell anything to, or that they, you know, even just that sense of familiarity, somebody who's got your back no matter what, and then all of a sudden it's, oh, wait, I don't have that anymore, so where do I go from here? So it is true that the, 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 most men who lose, lose a lot. And and many men don't take care of themselves because they just don't know. They They don't eat well because it's not convenient or... You know, they they throw themselves into their work to avoid the pain because, well, we're we're right, we're wired to avoid pain. So. Mm. From that side of things, you mentioned about you had an identity outside of your relationship. Um, how much of you do you think that people feeling lost and lonely and, and not having a place either don't have an identity for people that aren't aren't widowers, or that they lose? You know that they, they don't, or they they lose their identity if they had one, um, and then from there that that feeling of of being lost. How much do you think you your role of having your own identity outside of that, but being clear about your identity played in you being able to to bounce back? It 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 is all the difference. Mm. Um, I I I really say. Um, it's as much about identity, but identity is a lot about purpose as well. You you need to have a sense of purpose, even if that isn't a, uh, even if it's not apparent to others what that, you know, uh, the importance of it isn't apparent to others. You still need to have a sense of purpose. You still need to know. It's not about knowing who you are. Let's be honest. We're always evolving. We're always rediscovering. We're always, um, you know, adapting to our life and the circumstances around us and, and the people mm. around us. But if you don't have a if you don't have a sense of purpose and, and you don't have your identity, you don't have any kind of identity, you know, yes, lost is absolutely the perfect term. And and very much that um what are you driving for? What's moving you? What's motivating you? What's what's grabbing you and pushing you forward and giving you that um that forward driven life. And, and that's the trick is if you don't, um, what was it? Mahatma Gandhi, speed doesn't matter if you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> Good <point>. oh, Right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> From your right, perspective, well, no you said that you and your um, your wife 
lived with in any in intention if i write that down correctly you were yes. very intentional about how you did that where did that come from originally where how does because it sounds like from what we understand the people that are feeling lost and lonely and you know not having a, a a place in life is they don't have a purpose or they don't have an intention but where did yours come from how did you find out what that intention was well the the idea of uh, first of all a cancer diagnosis changes a lot of things and you you get you get very intimate with your mortality very quickly yes. even if it's not your diagnosis yes right? so and and time is precious time and, and this is something i learned very early I, my uh, the father i grew up with was a chartered accountant and mm -hmm. one of the things that he he was very quite adamant about and i was very fortunate in this is that he goes money is important but Money comes and goes. Time is the only thing you can never get more of. Mm. So I had that going in. I know, look, um, I, I had great parents, and I was listening to uh, Tony Robbins when I was 10 years old, you know, <laughs> personal okay. power. And we had it on the shelf, and I was listening to it. So, you know, I, I, was, I was indoctrinated into this very young. <laughs> yeah. So to um, my wife, uh, my late wife had uh, an interesting childhood in that um, her parents, her parents cared very much, but they didn't have much. And she was very much determined of making sure that her life had purpose and meaning. And, and she was very much concerned with that and being and, and giving back and being helpful. And it was very much a part of who she was. And likewise, I, I very much enjoy um helping people and the widower's wingman honestly stems from the fact that i i did i had a great conversation with a, a very good friend of mine looked into life experience and then it was like wait and i did some research and there's there's great resources out there for widowers now there wasn't originally you know, there wasn't about 10 years ago but there are some great authors like fred colby or um herb Knoll who have written wonderful books to kind of guide you through the process different aspects of the process mm. but dating aspect is always kind of glossed over and even just look I, i've met regular people who you know they, i tell them what i do and they're just like oh yeah online dating is tricky it's like online dating is a hardware store they won't <laughs> tell you how to build the deck but you can find all the things you need to build it there but they won't yes. tell you how you know you need to know your mission. you need to have a plan going in you need to know what mm. what it is that you need to know before you just kind of barrel in there and go yeah give me give me a deck it's like <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I guess from that perspective is, I mean, there's a couple of key things that you mentioned there about when we're talking about purpose. And you mentioned, you know, from your perspective, you had a dad that was was focused on. It seemed to have that kind of motivation. Is that? Did I hear that correctly? Oh, my mom did too. We there was there was a big ethic in the work. Uh, there was a big work ethic in the house, and it was very much about. Um, they were very much about. Um, work well and mm -hmm. and be they were very humanist in that you know mm -hmm. and, and leadership was very important and uh, leadership very early very early adopters of kind of what we now know as kind of simon sinek's uh, uh version of leadership of you know people first and um you know yes money comes and goes but you know relationships last and this kind of thing so there was a lot of that kind of mentality at mm. least the precursors to what we know now. Yeah. Um, that before Ted became a big thing, you know, <laughs> it was really cool. So, um, so that yeah, it, it really played a big role in my life, and um, so yeah, that a lot of the intentionality comes from there, and that um, you can you know if you don't have a direction, then where are you going? And you're allowed to change direction. And that's one of the things I was uh, I was taught. You know, like make a choice and. and if you're going to do it, do it and go all the way. But if, and you're allowed to change your mind later, you're allowed to, you're allowed to shift your course. You're allowed to change the path. So, and that kind of rubbed off on Sam and she had, she was very much, uh, Sam was almost all about uh, integrity and mm -hmm. that was really her thing. And it was all about integrity and, you know, um, we, we say under promise over deliver, but she was very much about I would rather an I would rather an unpleasant truth than a pretty lie. Mm. And, you know, very, very much about 
if you make a promise, you better be ready to move hell, you know, to move hell, heaven and hell to get to, to make sure that you you commit on that. So your word is all you've gotten. Yeah, <laughs> very much like that. And I'd say that nowadays, let's be honest, um, honesty and uh, integrity are the only uh, they, those are the currency of the day. Mm. In, in this world, more and more, yeah. It seems, yeah, when coming back to this, because I really want to understand this whole finding your purpose, what your your purpose is, Um, because I wonder about from the perspective of do you have to find your purpose or there seems to be a strong linkage, and I'm picking up from what you're saying as well about about giving back, about it being about other people, because you talked about you know, leadership and, and your parents were very much, it seems if I'm, if I'm reading into that correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but that your parents were very much into the leadership was caring about other people and helping other people was part of that leadership. Um, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, you're nodding your head. <laughs> for, the, for those yeah. listening without watching, he's nodding his head very profusely. <laughs> oh, yes, <it's> very adamantly. <laughs> yes, and you absolutely where, understood that. Yeah, because this is where I'm wondering from that perspective of, you know, people say you've got to find your purpose and people go on retreats and things like that and they go, oh, you know. And, and I wonder, is it a case of you just need to do something to help somebody else? That can be as simple as that. Is that does that work? It's a great start. Um, well, look, I, I'm going to geek out here a little bit because I'm I'm a neuroscience nerd. So here we go. Yeah, Star Wars reference? If... <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I do that from time to time. Simon Sinek has this beautiful speech about EDSO, but uh, that's um, endorphins, um, endorphins, dopamine, um, oxytocin, and serotonin, or yeah. serotonin and oxytocin, right? But let's be honest; these are the four biggest chemicals in our brain that drive us forward Mm. um serotonin is released when we perform an act of kindness or and this is the wonderful part witness an act of kindness and that wonderful things for our brain so the fact that uh, you know if helping somebody else absolutely has the most incredible incredible um effects for us and i i believe i read an article recently with that i think it was you who who said that uh, you know the, the you know an act of kindness has wonderful benefits for health it, it does absolutely yes. the the trick with and here's the catch finding your purpose don't go looking for it mm. um decide on a purpose what's important to you um and i i could go to mark manson on this one if you if you try to care about everything and that's i know that's not the terminology he uses and i love the terminology he uses but i'm not going to use it here <laughs> but if yeah. you care about anything then you're not you have no energy to care about anything well right yeah. matter of pick what's important to you pick pick your cause to champion champion it if you want to change direction yes go for it look um I, mm-hmm. There was a meme, and it was wonderful. It was um, the thing I hate most about meeting new people is having to try and put my uh, tr- having to try and explain my past as though it's a co- as though it's a cohesive narrative. <laughs> yes, <laughs> bit of a challenge, right? None of us have this wonderful cohesive narrative. It's just mm-hmm. not. It's not our thing. That we yeah. we we go through all of these things and. What's incredible is that the more you pick your purpose and you go for it, and if you do change your path, which, look, I'm I'm a perfect example of this. Um, I started as a graphics technician. I, I was about um, everything a graphic designer could do, but being able to do the entire production of it, including the machines and the maintenance and everything right through, right through the end and mm-hmm. dealing with the client, all of it. Yeah. That's what I started with, which led to how do people relate to information? Or mm. how do they relate to the design? Or how does the how does the design relay information so that it's easier to digest? How do people relate to information? To how do they relate to technology? To how how a relationship with technology changes? That's what I was doing before, and now to let's use technology to get connected. But mm. it's all psychology. It's yeah. all the same. Everything led to everything else to come to this point. Yeah. So choose one. I, I started. 
I started because I wanted to make really cool visuals. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I apprenticed and I learned wonderful things. And I learned how uh, I learned stuff that it, it's dying arts. And it's incredible to know how a printing press works and have operated one or mm-hmm. slide imaging, how the film actually works. But all of that to kind of get to, oh, well, how do we make this more effective? Because it's expensive to do this. And how do we make this more effective? How do people learn? How do people motivate? How do you know? How do we have our relationship? Relationship with technology is the same as relationship with a person. It's just we don't view it that way, but it's true. And then we start getting into relationship with people and how do we better better use technology to do exactly what we're doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was because right. that's something I wondered about. Was you know, do we just have to? Does it? the purpose come through some epiphany or is it as you say just do something that's important to you um i'd say start with do something that's important to you and you know as you the more you do the more you discover the more you discover the more you can go ooh, fine tune of course correct yeah you know and and see where it's i love that reference you talk about in serotonin as well because yeah we, we just the i hadn't made that connection um where you talked about um that when you witness uh what was it witness an act of kindness your body produces serotonin i was aware that if you if you just thought it you didn't have to do it i do this all the time where i'm walking down the street and i and i did it as an experiment to n- not change my facial expression but i was um wishing the other person well that they had a great day and it was interesting even though i i said i was very conscious about not changing my facial expression but as i looked at the person they would smile at me um, which was really interesting. Um, just this and that that whole process of producing dopamine and serotonin in your body just from that thought. And that's where I was wondering from that perspective, because when we we go through people feeling lost and lonely, I mean, is it a case of and you mentioned about you know your dad talking about money and people and and I've you know I've landed in Nice. Had a been chauffeured by a helicopter to Monaco, um, and that's fun. Don't get me wrong; it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Those kind of things are really cool. Sure. I, can't, I can't. I can't see any. I can't see any downside. <laughs> but to say that it was fulfilling, I couldn't honestly say that it was fulfilling. Um, you know, it's it's lovely to do, but yes. was uh, it wasn't fulfilling because it was all about me. When I look at it from that perspective, where does that? And when again, when we're looking at people that are feeling lost, lonely, and not having a um, place in the world, how much of that do you think is focusing on yourself as opposed to looking at how you could help others? Well, I think one of the words, I think the word, you hit the key word on the head, right? Everybody's go chases what makes them happy. Mm. Why do we chase what makes us happy? We shouldn't be chasing what makes us happy. We should be chasing what makes us fulfilled. Mm. Right. That that level of fulfillment. It's not just about because if we just chase happiness, aren't we just trying to live hedonistically? Mm. Well, if we're chasing for fulfillment, fulfillment doesn't come in the, as an individual thing, maybe in a short term. But anything worth sharing is that much richer for the experience. Anything you have to work for is more valuable to you. So um, I love the idea of. Um, look, uh, I like video games, but the most rewarding ones are the ones I get to play with other people at the same time. And it's not a competition. I don't like competitive. I like cooperative games. Mm. There are not tons of them out there, but they do exist. And it is wonderful to go to, to get in with a, a squad or a, a particular group of people and accomplish something together. That yeah. shared experience. And I think that really plays to that. Yeah, so that, that that shared experience, is that coming back? Because, again, people feeling lost, lonely. Lonely is a big key there. Um, and, I, and I was wondering about that because we talk about um, we're most connected ever in history, and, and you and I, we're talking across the planet at the moment, so we're very connected. Um, and we have all these devices and programs and apps and things like that to enable us to connect. And we're more connected ever in history, yet people feel more lonely. And I was I was thinking about that and wondering how much of that is because even with all this technology now, where 
putting stuff out there. We're going, you know, we're, we're giving our opinion. We're say, stating all this stuff, but we're not listening anymore. How much of that do you think that loneliness is connected to not listening and, and not having that shared experience? Simon and Garfunkel, Sound of Silence. Um, <laughs> there's the line in there that's people hearing without listening, people mm. speaking without, people talking without speaking, people hearing, people hearing without listening. Mm. And it's true. It's the. I, I'm going to put forward something a little bit cynical, but nonetheless, it, it is something that I've kind of pondered a great deal, and that is. Um, once upon a time, not that long ago, pre-industrial revolution, mm. the only literacy, common literacy is a very new thing. Mm. It's only, yeah. five, you know, 150 years or so. And yeah. the only reason they started teaching it broadly, our school system is designed to make factory workers. They're not designed to make leaders. They're not designed to teach you about life or teach you what you need. They're they're there to make workers. and. You need to be able to read the instructions just enough that nobody has to keep showing you, right? <laughs> and that's the thing. It's um, Before that, literacy was prominently only for um, monks, religious um, scholars, and the, um, the aristocrats, you know, mm. the quality and the, 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 the higher, the, the upper crust of society, basically the 1%. Yeah. So fast forward, literacy becomes widespread. Suddenly, publishing now, we've got more ideas coming into the marketplace. We've got more ideas, more ideas. Wait, these ideas are starting to get dangerous. Hey, what a great idea if we allow people to self-publish and flood the market with so much that nobody could ever pull the really important ideas out. Mm -hmm. So now you flood the market with ideas. So now we, we can read, but we're deluged with so much and i think the internet is the same and i think it's a matter of um we need more than ever to be so much more critical of you know what we're looking at and what we're taking in and you know we we really do have to kind of formulate our own ideas and decide again it really does come down to a, a certain amount of decisiveness um you know a confidence and decisiveness of i am going to go with this until i have reason not to hmm. Right. And and again, now, with even with the media, the media goes, well, this is good. Our eggs good. Well, it depends on who you ask. It depends on what decade, because eggs are good. Eggs are bad. Eggs took cholesterol. No, eggs are bad. Eggs are good. Eggs are bad. Milk. Milk is good. Milk is bad. No, no, milk substitutes. No, no, you should. No, no don't drink the substitutes. No. Drink. So much babble. Mm. And I'll eat eggs and I'll drink milk. <laughs> you know, is it good? Bad? Don't know. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> There's no real source behind it. That's you know we're we're not testing our theories anymore. So it's critical. It's critical thought. It's, I'm, I've made the decision that I'm going to drink milk. There you go. <laughs> is that when you talk about that flood of information? Because there is yeah. a lot of information out there, which is great. I mean, you can you. You're two mouse clicks away from getting any information you want to do achieve anything you want. The presupposition is you know what you want. Um, we'll come back to that. <laughs> oh, we will so come back to that. <laughs> the question I the question I have, and I, and I changed. Well, the, on the the want, I changed that because I asked people, "What do you want?" Oh, no. Um, so I changed the question to, "What do you choose?" And it was interesting how some light bulbs went off and went, "What? I have a choice." Yeah, you do. So yeah, well, let's unpack that. But I want to look. Uh, what I want to do is look at all this information that's out there. And I mean, outside of Shared Care, I have DamienAndrew.com, and and I work with high end corporates. And a large part of what I do is teaching them that life is actually simple. Success is simple. Do the simple things. Do the the common sense things, um, and don't get yourself bogged down with all the other crap. Um, and the companies that take that on have massive change. I mean, one of my clients was, and that was a small client. They were a small engineering company turning over eight million dollars. I said, do this instead, not do this in addition to. So they actually they actually did less work, <laughs> and they went from eight million to twenty five million um, by oh. doing less work. But doing the right work. I mean, how often do we hear work smarter, not harder? And how often do you see that happen? And when I we talk about, you know, this perspective, we're talking about finding your purpose. 
if you look at it, how, I mean, you've, I would no doubt you've heard the statement, treat others as you'd like to be treated. Um, of course. The golden rule. Um, exactly. Well, and when you look at that, if you look at someone who's lost lonely and not having their place in society, how often are they treating themselves how they'd like to be treated? Love that. Um, one of the best, I read an article and it was, as a business owner, it's like, you have an employee. No, no, even if you're solo, you have an employee and you treat them like garbage because you expect so much and you drive them and you don't value them. And that's because you're pushing yourself like that. Be the Mm. boss you would want to have, right? So exactly what you're saying. Right. Get down to the simplicity. Um, Treat others as you would like to be treated. It's funny. um, even if you start getting into Alan Watts, for example, so much of it, so much of it is the, the counterintuitive model of, you know, no, no, the common answer is this, but it's actually the other way. Around. I will be happy when I get the job. I will be happy when I get the car. I will be happy mm. when I retire. I will have time to do things when I retire. But what if you don't reach retirement? You, yeah. you don't get happiness by doing something. Our dopamine proves that we're, we're, we're physically designed not to be happy when we attain something we we can choose like you mentioned we can choose to be happy and it's amazing that once you choose to be happy how everything sort of falls into place and makes everything easier it's incredible and the same is true of dating it's mm. if you know what you if you know what a good relationship looks like because most people you ask them what a good relationship looks like and they go, or what they want, and they go, well, I don't want, and I don't want this, and I don't, are we going to do relationships by deduction? <laughs> I mean, sure, if you have a few years, why not? But, you know, no, we let's let's do the work now. Yes, it's work. It, it, it takes brain power, but, and that's why a coach is so helpful there, because like you like you coach people through that, having somebody kind of guide you through the process and go, hey, you don't have to be killing yourself this hard. <laughs> you don't have to be killing yourself to do this. Just let's get clear yeah, and work on the simple things. And all of a sudden, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I said from, I wonder about that a lot. And And I know, I mean, I'm probably like the ex-smoker that goes, you know, you shouldn't smoke because, I mean, I've screwed up my life monumentally at times by doing stupid stuff. Um, and, you know, I can write an encyclopedia, encyclopedia Britannica on all the things that I've screwed up in my life and made it difficult because I was just doing stupid stuff and wasn't listening to what people were telling me <laughs> or even just listening to what was going on around. Um so it's kind of like I'm I'm in that space now, but I, I do look at life and go, well, it is pretty simple. But how do you do that? And same token too, I've I've been, you know, I've been to a number of of help groups. I've been to AAs, um, a number of other it's specifically men's helps groups, and I didn't understand for a long time the whole point of you're not allowed to give advice; you just listen. Um. Which is ironic because as a trainer, I understood that because I I would always start education with, I can't teach you anything. All I can do is share information and you can learn when you're ready. But I didn't get it in this space. But how does someone go through that? Do you have to go through a whole bunch of pain to actually to go, okay, I'm not going to feel lonely. Um, I'm just going to get up, get out and actually go and help some people and that will change my life. D- does someone need to go through that pain? A friend of mine, she once said, you know, you learn through pain until you learn to learn through joy. Um, you know, d- how does someone, how do you help someone wake up if they don't want to wake up? Oh, that's, so I love your, you know, I can't teach you anything. Um, I, I like Einstein's approach, which is I, I can't teach you anything. I can merely put in the, I can merely put in place a scenario by which you will learn. Yeah. So I think I like to think Einstein learned that from me, but in the time's out. <laughs> <laughs> I would like that too. That would be really cool. <laughs> now I know where it comes from. Okay, well, we're starting off. 
I'm Don't reincarnated, you. you know. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to offend someone with that comment, but that's okay. As I keep repeating on here, I don't read my comments. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, so that's, um, I love that. Um, defining your purpose or finding your purpose, it, yeah, no, you, you really um, – I. It, hmm. It is a good one. This is a very, very good question. And I'm, I just want to formulate it the right way. Mm. Um, the, the challenge with purpose, it, you know, it's it's about finding something that gives you fulfillment, not just happiness. I mean, if it gives you happiness, great. If it gives you fulfillment, even better. Mm. Um, but usually when you're when you're in that funk, mm. it's hard to get up and get out mm. right it's not easy to just kind of look after after sam passed away look i yeah i had my you know i had my identity and all of that but there were days i'm not kidding i would sit there in the dark I would, or i would lay on my bed in the dark why because it just allowed me to let my brain kind of work work through it or it allowed my subconscious to do what it had to do mm. um I highly encourage people to take time and daydream or look at clouds or, you know, those, those moments where we would be bored. It's, it's so, it's so incredible when you learn how to, to, to maximize that brain space. Um, there's a movie where Dustin Hoffman and what's, um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Dustin Hoffman's in it and it's called Mr. Magorian's Wonder Emporium. And at one point they say, uh, 37 seconds, now we wait. He goes, no, we breathe, we ingest. Our hearts beat, our minds create, our souls ingest. 37 seconds well used is a lifetime. Yeah. You know, that and the other one is your life is an occasion, rise to it. I'd rather enjoy that one too. But the, <laughs> I love that you got movie quotes because I've got a collection of little snippets from movies and other things that I've put together as a reminder. You know, got Patrick Swayze in there and, and Tom Hanks and <laughs> all kind of stuff. Anybody who knows me for any length of time knows that I have said that I, I say this virtually on a daily basis to anyone who, you know, to, to anyone who who knows me and it's the imp that runs the jukebox in my head is a sadist and <laughs> i have a an entire media library because i memorize pretty much everything so yeah <laughs> I, I have a whole lot of i have a whole lot up there and it all just kind of oh yeah that's handy yeah exactly i mean we've got three in week. mind <laughs> What about, I mean, because, and, and I love, and I, I get this a lot with people in this space, um, and I'm included in that. Now, my my parents weren't, by far, weren't the perfect parents. They had many, you know, flaws, certainly, in, in, and their relationship didn't stay together as well. Um, so there was, there was issues there. But with that, my parents also taught me things of, you know, one of the things I remember growing up was like, if, if you do something wrong, you better tell us first, because if we find out the other way, you're going to be in trouble twice, <laughs> you know. Um, but they were also very much, and living by example, my my dad and, and mum helped out with the local clubs and, and we would um, bring home, my dad would bring home the, it must have been the treasurer because he'd bring home all the money and we'd count the money. And so that was, a. but as a family, we did that. So we did that as a family. Um, and we got that experience. But same token, too, when the Christmas parties were coming up, um, and this is where we must have worked out, I mean, I must have been ignorant as a child because we were packing the Santa lolly bags and then we were receiving them and I never worked out too that there wasn't really Santa. <laughs> <laughs> but but the oh, thing was we were packing and that was always the exciting thing because we got you know there was always ra odd numbers of lollies that didn't fit into the bag in, in equal proportion so we got those as a because you can't have a lolly bag and another kid gets a lolly bag it's got different things in it it has to be the same right. and there was leftovers and, and we got there so that was always exciting but we we had that and, and listening to yourself talk as well 
you know, you, you had, and, and I don't know what your parents' relationships were like and, and everything growing up, but I'm, I'm sure there was imperfections and there was, but there was some stuff there that gave you a really good, solid foundation. And that's where, from my perspective, similar sort of thing, it was, you know, honesty and you know, be kind to others, care about other people. That was something that was there for me growing up and sounds like it was there for you. And, and majority of people I've talked to, that was all there. Um, how does someone who may not have had that find their way? How does someone find, you know, when you look at it and go, well, you know, were we just lucky and, and it's ordained for us? Or can someone who hasn't had that experience learn that? Um, I've got I've got you on this one. I, I, was, I was pondering something earlier today and I've got you here. Um, we are in a society that is engineered from the ground up to keep us in survival mode. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of people live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Um, they they are told, you know, you, you say, I've got dreams or I'd like to accomplish something. And everybody's like, yeah, but there's no money in that. Or, they're, you know, why would you want to do that? Mm. Why would you? Uh, Jim Carrey's, you know, uh, Jim Carrey's father, who went and worked as an accountant. I think mm. it was an accountant. And he always wanted to be a jazz musician. I think it was a jazz musician and or a, a jazz musician or a comedian or something. Like that. But he he went and took the safe route for, for the family's sake. And I get that. Mm. If you're going to, if you can fail at something you hate, why wouldn't you at least take the shot at failing at something you love? Yeah. Why would you at least take the chance, right? But we're discouraged from doing that. And it, it kind of goes to the, we live in a society, do we, we, in a society that profits from your self-doubt, liking yourself, liking, liking yourself is an act of rebellion. Mm. And I love that quote. It's, I saw it as a meme, and I, I saved it to my photos, and I love that. Mm. But our society is designed to keep us always on the, you know, always kind of half-tipped, always in survival mode. Mm. Trick with tr- the trick with purpose is either aligning your aligning your purpose to your life so that you can follow that as a seamless path or um, to get out of survival mode into a thrive mode where you have, you can free up enough mental bandwidth. You can free up enough that you're not constantly on the dopamine rush, the, you know, the uh, endorphin, the we're always, we're, we're designed to chase that next televisions, the, the, the tube televisions pulse, in such a way that we did, we enter alpha th- alpha theta state. Alpha theta state is the way your brain goes when you're not quite asleep and not quite awake. So when we mm. watch those old CRT televisions, yeah, and or the cathode ray tube television, and we you know you zone out, it's yeah. because the TV is pulsing to make your brain dumb not dumb down, but mm. not shut down. You can't, but to keep it in a state where it's neither real nor not and you're you're not quite lucid but you're not quite in a mode where it's you're actually being productive in the background it's Mm. remarkable so the more you can kind of get out of that or at least if you have a goal in mind and you can you know you you start your side hustle and then all of a sudden you're like okay gotta get the side hustle you still have your job and whatnot and you can transition from the job to the side hustle as it does better Mm. it takes work but if your purpose is strong enough, you you will you you will be motivated. You 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 can hack your brain. You can hack that endorphins and the dopamine and all of that. And if you're using if serotonin and oxytocin are getting involved, well, even better. Like then then you you've got the whole kit and let's go. You know? Yeah. So yeah, uh, you, you talk about I mean, and you reference work there as well. And I I always cringe when I hear work. Um, you know, to say that I'm not busy and putting in efforts. Is, would be an understatement because um, <laughs> I've always got stuff doing and I'm doing so many different things. Um, but I don't view it as work. Um, and and this is where I'm wondering from people that are, again, stuck feeling lost and lonely and not having a a place in society, is it, you know, this, this case of, oh, you know, that's work, um, you know, it's hard. I can't do that. And and linking that to what you said about liking yourself, because um, I look at my son and I taught him from from a very early age. The focus was on his character. From me, I was all about building his character and and 
you know, if the education wasn't there, you know, it can always learn more. But I mean, he's now 14 and doing well um, academically as well. Um, but it was always about, you know, like yourself. And, you know, I know from my perspective, I, there was probably a number of times throughout my life where I didn't like myself. And for me, when I look at how I changed that, because a belief is just a thought you've repeated over and over again. Now, that's my understanding. Um, I learned that from Wayne Dyer and, yep. um, and not personally, I never met him personally, but you know, we, we, I've listened to him over and over, and over again. So we feel close. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was How to Be a No Limit Person is my favourite book of all time, even though it's not a book, it's an audio. Um, I yeah. used to think it was a book and I was trying to find it and could never find it, but it's an audio, <laughs> only an audio. Um, and how I changed was simply repeated, I like myself, over and over again. And that was all I did. To me, again, it wasn't hard, but it had a profound shift. Is it as simple as that for, for other people as well? There's this exercise that um, I've done personally, and I, I, I will do this on occasion. Mm. And you can it can take a while to get to be, to be able to go a full 24 hours. Our brains do not comprehend negation. Mm -hmm. So, um, not walking is not the same, uh, or, you know, like, um, how, what's a good example of this? Um, not taking the car is not the same thing as walking, mm -hmm. or uh, the idea of um, an anti-war rally mm. and a peace demonstration are two entirely different things. Mm. Demonstrating peace is a forward thinking. We're going towards the peace aspect. Mm. Anti-war rally implies that there must be war for which to be anti and your brain must don't think of a pink elephant you can say don't think of a pink elephant all you want your brain must conjure the elephant in order to negate it so there's what to reference right but the same thing with the anti-war or the war on drugs mm. well it implies that there must be drugs one way or the other whether we like it or not and throughout the course of human history there have always been drugs mm. regardless of how the the authorities at the time perceived that whether it's prohibition, whether it's you know ayahuasca in you know South America, whether it's it doesn't matter what you're looking at, what type of drug you're referring to. There's always mm. been drugs, but this idea of we're going to have a war on drugs, it's designed to keep you thinking about fighting and drugs because that's where your brain is goes. Is it designed that way, or is it just ignorance? Because I hear that all the time as well, and I, oh, and I deliberately use the ignorance word because I used to do this. I would say, "Don't forget this," and I'd forget it. And I've right. since trained myself to go, I will remember. And it's yes. amazing how many times I don't even have to tell myself now. I'll be going somewhere and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, got to grab that. And it's become a whole different way of thinking. Um, and is that from that perspective, again, is that something to do with, you know, the people that are feeling lost and lonely? And, I mean, we, we focus on men, but it applies to women as well. That but their you know, focus is like about. you're talking about, oh, you know, you know I, I can't succeed as opposed to, what is my purpose? Is that the shift that needs to happen? That's part of it. It's certainly a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely think it was intentional because, I mean, look, you, you go from the First World War, it, Car Carlin talks about, George Carlin talks about this one. You go from shell shock to operational exhaustion to, um, oh, I forget the third one, but then you go to post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. It's designed to make it less... Um, less visceral. It's designed to take the emotion out of it. So when somebody is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, half the people people can't really fathom that as being something so terrible. I mean, it, yes, it is a terrible thing, and people can suffer it without a war. It's, it's when your nervous system just can't take any more. But shell shock really sells that point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when you start talking about our society has very much been kind of geared to keep us in survival and, and so on. And, you know, what, what, is, what are some of the first things we're told? You know, um, you know, work hard. Um, you know, money is hard. We're taught money is hard. You know, making money is hard. It, it isn't if you do it well 
It isn't if you if you're clever Warren Buffett's about it. a classic example of that. I mean, as he talks about it, you lose a, lose a bunch of your IQ, and you're more likely to make money than than if you <laughs> and you don't have to work that hard. Just you know, he what? How many companies does he own? Not many stocks in the stock yeah. market. <laughs> do, exactly. do, do we want to overcomplicate it though? I mean, because is that a, a, a threat to our? perceived intelligence where we think you know we, we we want to be perceived as smart so we've got to have these really really and i've read this with a number of government reports where they go on for pages and just talking around in circles and going you have no idea what you're talking about um but where, why do we want to be perceived as smart that's is that for our ego yeah is, but is that for ego is that for how we keep up with the joneses or how we work with you know how we are perceived in society again as mm. that external thing so are you lonely because you're being told you're lonely or that you should be lonely or that nobody will understand you there uh, well this is the question i have and, and i hated it as a child and said so maybe i'm fortunate in that regard um my, my mum used to wear these horrible beanies and this was before beanies were cool and i hated it and she'd be like it doesn't matter what other people think about you it doesn't matter um, and as a kid, I hated it. But I think as a young child, it was ingrained deeply somewhere that when I actually got rid of all the crap that came on, on top of it, it became, Sita, I don't care what people think about me. It doesn't matter. Um, what matters is what I think about me. But how do we get to that? Why, why are we so concerned about you know what other people might think? We, we mentioned, we were talking in the pre-show about you know um, men not having you know, sure of what they should be doing. Should we open the door for, for people? Now, I open doors and let other people out of the elevator. It doesn't matter what gender you are. I'll, I'll offer first. It's just an act of kindness. Um, but do we, have we got to that point where we've, you know, we, we're too focused on, oh, someone someone said they were offended. Well, that's their offense, not you, <laughs> you being offensive. Um, the line that did it for me was, you will um you should you'll care far less what other people think about you when you realize how seldom they do <laughs> yes that's the one that did it for me yeah. um so i love that but um yeah. i think that uh, look uh, society is a big thing we we, we are again overcomplicated polarized um we're we're just people Right, and you hold the door for somebody, like you said. Uh, I don't care what gender they are. I don't care what color they are. I don't care their nationality. Or, or we, we we all bleed red. Uh, you know, mm. I'll hold the door for I'll hold the door for people. What actually kind of bothers me a little bit is when I hold the door for somebody and they go to push the door open, like I'm going to slam it on them or something. It's like <laughs> you do not trust me. At the most basic of levels, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to continue holding this for you. I haven't That's experienced just that. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a bit. I haven't experienced but, that one, but yeah, I could imagine that would be going, you really? <laughs> really? <laughs> exactly. But do you but, think, I mean, uh, we've got to, because when I look at it, and the people that I talk to, and, and maybe I said it, it's a bias on, on the people that I associate with, but, I mean, I meet a lot of people and speak to a lot of people, and, and fundamentally they're all nice and kind and, and thoughtful. And, and when I look at things that you hear on social media and things like that, it gets – is it getting way blown out of proportion where it's you've got a minority there that – I call it the screechy wheel. Um, you know, talk about the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I, I well, I've, I've, I've changed it to screechy because I think that's what it is. There's a few people screeching to get attention, but that gets blown right out of proportion. Um, is that part of the is that the is it the majority that are having that screech, or is it just no? I, I think we have a, a use that element disconnect in what we're told versus what the reality is. Mm. Um, I, I really. Um, I, the thing that I, the, the the phrase about the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. Um, and and it, the the idea of you know, okay, well, airplanes are dangerous. You know, I'd rather drive. Well, why? More people die in car crashes 
per number of vehicles than people die in airplanes per number of airplanes. Mm. In fact, planes are infinitely safer because they are safety checked and maintained and so often. Is it tragic when one goes down? Absolutely. Of course it is. And mm. they publicize it so much that people are afraid of planes, but think, nobody thinks twice about getting in their car. Mm. I th- the same argument could be made for, you know, somebody put lights a cigarette. Look, I'm not a smoker. I don't particularly like that. But, you know, if, if that's your choice, that's your choice. Again, choices, right? I was a smoker. It was stupid. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> the people out there listening. Cigarette, nobody says a word. But you go to eat a candy bar. Well, diabetes kills more people than smoking does. Mm. Right? But nobody thinks twice about a candy bar. But people, yeah. be, you know, somebody eats a light cigarette. Really? Mm. You know? So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think our society has really polarized us. And uh, social media, I think the the of the people that are on social media, the most active that you're going to see, because let's be honest, the algorithm favors the content creator, the people who create the most content generally, mm. um, the, how that content is received. Well, if you put out more into the world, chances are you have a better chance of going viral because one of those will catch. Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden you've got 5% on this side, 5% on this side, they're screaming the loudest. And then you've got 90% of us in the middle who, whether we create or not, we consume the content, but we're consuming the extremes. Mm. So scale in the middle, we're just kind of going, this is crazy. The world is crazy <laughs> because that's what we see. <laughs> Which is, I mean, and I linked that back to, you know, liking yourself. Cause I said, I, I spent a lot, I was going to say spend a lot of time, but obviously I've got a 14-year-old son. I've spent a lot of time with him. <laughs> but it wasn't – oh, was, I, I just wanted to catch it in, in this perspective. It wasn't a lot of effort um, with my son focusing on do you like yourself? And I'd always ask him, do you like yourself? And it got to the point where he goes, Dad, yeah, I like myself. I was like, shut up, Dad. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but well, uh, what I've noticed, like and I, I'm not sure whether it's linked to this or not because I'm not sure how to test it, but – He's not on social media. We go out and he'll leave his phone. I mean, he's had a, a phone forever. Um, and But we'll go out and I'll see the phone on a, the desk and we'll be going out with my friends or, you know, people my age or my, my dad's age um, when I go out with my dad. And it'll be, uh, you, you, I initially saw he, he left his phone on his desk and I was... I said, you've left your phone there. Do you want to bring it? Because it might be a bit boring. And he goes, nah, be fine. And um, so, and that's where I'm coming back to that. When you like yourself and you go, we, when we come back to that question of treating yourself as you would treat others, would you, if you really like yourself, would you go, mm, this is a bit crap. Maybe I'll turn it off. Um, again, I'm going to quote Simon Sinek on this one. Um, I love when he talks about if you're st- if you're talking with somebody and I have my phone on the table, mm. screen down. If I have my phone on the table, you are no longer the most important the most important person to me because mm. I have this kind of at the ready. Yeah. So the idea of uh, I think we do need to start connecting more. I think I'm not saying that social media is a bad thing, but just like just like television isn't a bad thing in and of itself, it's a mm. wonderful medium can be used for incredible things. I have learned some wonderful things through television. Mm. I've also seen a lot of crap. <laughs> but it's, I think it's really... So I'm going to border on the line there, um, cross the, because I, I mean, I learned a lot from Knight Rider and I loved that show when I was in the 80s. <laughs> you know, but uh, is it I crap? Uh, maybe there's a bit of crap know. in there too. <laughs> I'm re-watching the original He-Man series now. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> um, just for just for interest's sake, if you when you get to the end of that, take a look. There's a Netflix series called The Toys That Made Us, and they actually yeah. have a whole episode of He-Man. I've seen and it. And you find out that it was not intentional, but any first or not in the way we think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's uh, and that's where it kind of reminded me of the series, and then I got the series. But from that, I mean, I mean, there. So yeah, there is a lot of good in that. I mean, I look at using that as an example. My son, who's who's quite organised in his schoolwork and things like that. And when he's done his you know, free time and I'm uh, sorry, when he's done his schoolwork and he's played his sports and all that kind of stuff, you know, he likes video games, which isn't unusual. And there was one time there where he had a, a nine-hour binge on the video game. 
And I was like, did you get the big boss? And he goes, yeah, I got there eventually. I said, well, that's great determination. That was my focus, not, you know, why are you playing video games for, you know, nine hours? You know? um, it's, it's not like he's playing nine hours every day. So you it's know. like, exactly. It's it's. But again, if you've done everything you need to do and you want to have your free time, that's how you have your free time. Nobody ever questions Hey, why did you spend nine hours on that book? You know, you were really hooked. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And what does a fourteen-year-old kid do, really, after if they've done the homework? But that's where you're talking about the the media again. Feeling, I mean, coming back to this lost and lonely, and and not having a a place in society. Um, you know, is it that focus where we're thinking? You, you mentioned about the pink elephant. Yeah, the focus is, oh, uh, you know, I'm I'm anti this. I'm I'm looking at, uh, I can't go out into the world because some, and I swear it's an urban myth. Um, some woman might get upset at me for holding the door open for her because I've yet to meet someone that that happened to. You know, <laughs> where someone's yelled at someone for holding the door open for them. Do you think we we over sensationalizing things that aren't real, rather than just getting out there and finding out what is real? I think that uh, I think that we 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 need to start connecting with each other, and that that's the that mm. goes to the, the lonely. I mean, there's there's a difference between lonely and solitary. If somebody's solitary and they're good on their own and they're they're okay, and mm. yes, when they want to socialize, they go out and socialize, and that's fine. And but they're okay on their own. That that's different from lonely, where you could be surrounded by people, and it's mm. up here. Yeah, right. Lonely is, in, lonely is a state of mind. Yeah. Right. So the, the fact is, is that um, but also, too, you know, yes, you, you may have lost somebody, but I think it's really important that um, for those for anybody listening who, who knows somebody who's lost, whether they're a widow, a widower, whether they lost a parent, whether they've lost a mm -hmm. brother, a sister, for God's sake, check in on them, get them mm -hmm. out of their routine. We, if we get each other out of our routines, if we show each other, if we're open to listening and we like your son, he's interested. He'll go out. He doesn't need the phone to, you know, to to distract him. Mm. He can be interested in what's going on in the world around him. And the more we get interested in the world and the people around us, the far less lonely you'll be because all of a sudden you find opportunities to help. You find opportunities to get to, to engage with the world and have the world engage with you. And that's a connection that's, again, serotonin, um, endorphins. You know, mm -hmm. all the good, stuff, and you know what, with the right people, oxytocin, and we love oxytocin. Oxytocin is actually anti, anti-addictive. Like it, it has anti-addictive properties. It's wonderful. I love what you just said then about being interested, because they talk about if you want to be an interesting person, be interested in other people. But same token too, is that, um, is that a point for, for not being lonely, lost and and not having a purpose, be interested in something. Well, yes. You, I mean, a lot of people, here's the thing, right? Um, I'm a geek. I freely admit that. Big Bang Theory, great geek, right? You want to yeah. get into... I'm a super nerd, too. We can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get into sci-fi. You want to get into uh, neurology, psychology, technology, uh, a whole lot of ease. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So a whole bunch of that. Uh, look, I can drop quotes and talk media, and we can we can have a blast, and I can I can sit and converse with people quite comfortably because I like learning new things, and I love I love meeting new people and trying new things. And but I do uh, in a conversation, you can see I'm I'm quite out, you know, I'm quite uh, I'm quite open, I'm quite you know uh, mm. exuberant in in a lot of cases. But in, when I meet new people, I will say my piece. And, oh wait! Uh, the, the quote that taught me this one: "This, mm -hmm. this you'll like. <laughs> you need to stand tall to be seen, speak loud to be heard, and sit down to be appreciated." <laughs> so it. I'll say what I have to say where it's relevant, and then I want to learn what their perspective is. I'm I'm mm -hmm. interested. I'm curious, and people find me interesting because of that. And I, I learned so much, and it's it's fun to meet people. It's fun to do that, and it. That that's one thing I work with when I work with people. That's a huge thing that we work on. It's that and you know, well, a lot of things. Most of clarity, a lot of clarity work. A lot of you know, be interested, be be engaged with the world. 
the world is a wonderful place if you choose, if you, again, coming down to choice, if you choose to engage with it. That statement that you just said, say what you have to say when it's relevant. I mean, how often do people feel that they're not relevant because they don't have anything to say? Um, well, it's kind of the flip side of the coin of the person who dominates the conversation by just keeping it on them or mm-hmm. just keeps going because they they want to they want the attention. The person who feels that they're it, that's again that that kind of issue of I don't want to be seen as boring. I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be seen as a geek. Oh, God, no, I don't know. I if you're interested in something. Even the strangest thing. Look, if you're interested in, in stamps, that's great. If you're interested in family genealogy, find your people. There are people out there who are really into genealogy. Go for it. The trick is, is when you go into a party and all you can talk about is genealogy, you kind of tend to lose some of the crowd. <laughs> that's where that's where the, 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 the listening to be interested. <laughs> but is that interested. part of that case? I mean, I love that what you just said there. You know, if you're interested in something, find your people. And is oh, that, yeah. yeah, I mean, is that something that we need to acknowledge and going, you know, we're all different. We've all got things that we like. I mean, we know that's why communism never worked because we're not all the same. We're all very, very different. How can you give everyone equal stuff when we all want different things? Um, we're motivated differently when we, correct. What, what fills us is different. So is that a case of going, hey, you know, we're all different. I love that for, from, I'm going, to, I'm going to do the pop culture thing now. It's one of my favorite things from Crocodile Dundee, where they're talking about psychiatrists. And, you know, she asked, do you, you know, you probably don't have a psychiatrist in Walkabout Creek. How do you get things out in the open? He says, well, we have a problem. We tell Wally. Wally tells everybody else. No more problem. Um, is it, you know, <laughs> but is it a case of, of from that perspective is we, we, because we're not engaging with people, we're thinking our, you know, we're unique in the sense of, you know, we've got all these problems that nobody else has and, and we don't fit in and all that kind of stuff. Whereas if we just got out there engaged with people, we'd, we'd learn. I mean, I've been fortunate. I've traveled to 44, at least 44 different countries. And everywhere I went, a smile was a smile. People wanted good things for their children. They wanted to enjoy life. They wanted to connect with their friends. Um, they because obviously I wasn't going down to basements finding people that were hiding there <laughs> in the cafe and stuff. But it, I mean, when we look at it from that perspective, fundamentally we're all the same, and so we want to have that connection. Is it a case that we just need to again just go? Well, okay, this is what I like. That's unique. What I like, but there's it's unique to the point of there's a whole bunch of other people out there that like, and I just need to find them. It's a case if there are other people out there and you, you just need to find them and mm-hmm. the internet makes it a lot easier. Um, the fact is, is that, okay, um, there's there's two sides to the we're, we're absolutely unique. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that we're not. The combination of elements makes us unique, mm-hmm. but the elements in and of themselves are not. So we have, it's like, oh, well, I have this problem that nobody else would understand. Well, if nobody else would understand it, the support groups wouldn't work. <laughs> yes. Right? It's the fact, the fact <laughs> the that, yes, we, while the circumstances of, okay, so I took care of my wife um, as best I could for a certain time. Eventually, she had to go into um, into care, into the hospital, and that was she didn't come out of the hospital. That's not a unique experience. The circumstances of our relationship were were not unique. There are other relationships like it. The fact that those two coincided, it's the matrix of things that is unique, but not the individual parts of that matrix. So it's the the idea of um, you and I can both talk about uh, things that we could both geek out. Right, mm. we could talk. Again. <laughs> Let's go. We can, we can <laughs> have the power. <laughs> we can joke about he man memes all day. Let's go. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, need my pink shirt. <laughs> pardon? Need my pink shirt like Prince Adam. <laughs> there you go. Right. So, but the thing is, is that we when we're in a crowd, we go open. Oh, 
you know, th that's again the perception of reality versus the reality. It's mm. um, you could be in a room, uh, you could be in a party, and you could go, "Well, I don't want to seem like the weirdo." Seem like the weirdo. I, what was it? Wedding Crashers. Um, stand out, but uh, st well, always weddings stand out, and a funeral. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. when they're wedding crashing, you know, it's like uh, always stand out, but on your own terms. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's it's a matter of if you quote unquote, let your freak flag fly, I guarantee you other people will acknowledge it. And if somebody doesn't like it, that's their problem, not yours. <laughs> you know? Isn't that too? I mean, we come back to, we're talking about how, you know, finding your place. I mean, letting your freak fra flag fly. I love that. If I can say it. And the English is my second language. I don't have a first one. Um, you know, <laughs> but if you can let your freak flag fly, isn't that just confidence and people attracted to confidence regardless? Well, that's where confidence comes from, right? Is that um, I, I, I'd say um, one thing that I, ha I have to mention is the, the idea of strength, right? A lot of people think strength for a man is, no, you have to be strong. Boys don't cry, bottle it up, suck it up, buttercup. You know, mm. this, this whole toxic masculinity, bullshit. Of, you know, no, no, you have to be, you have to be the pillar for everyone. No, you don't. And the most important part of that is true strength comes from inner peace. Mm. The ability to, to say, I am who I am. I am as I am. I trust myself to know who I trust. I know myself to know, to say, I don't know. I know myself well enough to know that I am that I can talk to another human, and it may not be perfect. It, the outcome may not be perfect, but the experience, it will be worthwhile. I will learn something. I will come away better for it. Mm. And I think this whole idea of we have to, uh, uh, young MC, um, there's a song where he's talking about, um, you know, when you're at a job interview, the only difference between you and the other guy is he. you think you're losing and he thinks you're winning. Mm, exactly right? You're thinking the same thing <laughs> right. so it's like hey you think you're losing he thinks you're winning that's mm. the difference yeah. but you know what if if you go in and detach yourself from the outcome and make the choice to engage will you win will you win every you know will, will every encounter be spectacular no but if you don't have any encounters none of them will be spectacular and it's yeah. about finding things that are spectacular. And then you meet your people. <laughs> I love that from that because I've always wondered about it. But Well, I learned a long time ago it's a numbers game. When I was in the Army, um, one of the guys I was there with, he was he was a good-looking guy, but he wasn't you know very bright. But he was always dating these amazing women. They were beautiful. They were intelligent. They were kind. Um, and we couldn't work it out. And one day it's like, how, how are you doing? And we thought, you know, maybe he's well hung or something like that. And so we, um, you know, I asked him one day, I said, Shane, you're not that bright. I did say this. You're not that bright. How is it you're dating all these amazing women? And he turned into this wise, I'm going to reference Star Wars, Obi-Wan character. He put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Damien, what you don't see is I ask a lot. Most of them say no. You just see the ones that say yes. And and is it, I mean, that's where I come confidence because we do that. I have a program where we teach confidence and I t the difference between experience, which is having done something repetitively enough that you're going to be able to do it competently. You know, um, James LeBron or whatever they're called, Michael Jordan, you know, getting throwing a, bas a ball into a hoop um, is something they could do very competently because they've done it so many times. They have experience. Self confidence. We've all got that. We, as a children, as infants, we the reason we can walk is because on average, I don't know who does these studies, does these studies, but somebody did. Apparently, you fall over um, eight thousand times before you can actually walk competently. <laughs> you know? But and so and self confidence is that ability to get up and give it another go. Um, and that's self confidence. Not that you're going to succeed, but you're going to give it a go. And then the third part of that was self-esteem, which is regardless of what happens, you like yourself anyway. Um, is that, you know, from that perspective, is it, 
again, is it just more about education around that? What what you're viewing at when you're looking at this social media, um, and it's not dissing, I agree with you completely. It's a tool. A tool can be used for you know any 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 purpose. So use it for a good intention. Yes. Um, but when you're looking at social media and you're going, oh, this person's really successful, and and you know they do that despise youtube for the amount of stupid ads that it has on there that i'm a billionaire success overnight and i'm flying my plane to whatever at 12 it's like can you cut those ads out please um that's my beef uh but it's when you're looking at that you know as a a rational adult you go well you know that's maybe that is true but there's a whole bunch of experience that goes with that as opposed to, you know, I mean, compare, well, let's take Warren Buffett. I mean, the guy's, what, 90 and massively, massively wealthy. Obviously, that's happened over a period of time. It didn't happen overnight. Um, is it a case where we need to just separate that out and go, you know, just put a bit of common sense in there? Everything is about, like, everything is moderation and common sense. Mm. I, I really do believe that. I think with any tool, uh, social media, uh, like I said, uh, television is a great medium. It can do so much. Um, social media is a great tool. It can do so much. We can learn so much. We can really, um, we can go so far beyond. But yes, it's moderation and common sense. Mm. Well, I'm oh, sorry. I, I had a I had a colleague at one point who, uh, and bless him, he I said, uh, you know, it's just a little common sense. He goes, spider sense. Like, oh, it's spider sense. I was like, why do you call it spider sense? Because, because, because it's pretty much a superpower nowadays. <laughs> Taj, bless you for that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to put that back to that because I've brought that up a couple of times in education I've done before with the, the common sense kind of thing. We go, well, common sense. You know, for us as an adult, if we're standing near a busy road, it's common sense not to step out into that traffic to a young child that may never experience a road before. Would they have that common sense to go, well, actually, I'm likely to get hurt? Um, and that's why I'm wondering, is common sense partly experience as well? Coming back to the whole forming of beliefs, it's what you repeat over and over again. Um is it a case of having that foundation like you and I had where, where we had parents that were you know, from the very beginning, some common sense taught to us. Well, I, okay, let's, let's start with the, there are so many, so many natural selection jokes to be made here. However, <laughs> Darwin, however, Darwin Awards, <laughs> Darwin Awards, anyone? Thank you. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, um, no, but also too, look, um, as children, we play, mm. we are encouraged to play. Yeah. Video games have their place, mm -hmm. but because video games do teach problem solving, they do teach uh, coordination, they do teach. Uh, there, there are certain things that help rhythm, timing. There's, a, there's a whole ton of things you can learn from video games. But again, everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. um, nothing bothers me more than seeing parents um, look. If you're in a pinch and whatnot, and you give the kid the phone, you know, you give a, a young child. I'm talking like two, three years old, a phone, and keep them busy for a few minutes. That's one thing. But the ones who do it habitually, mm. no, no. But I'm getting off track. Um, I, I really, yeah, I, we really do need to. No, never mind. I lost. I lost my train of thought. That's all right. Because <laughs> so, I was just trying to understand what the you know whether the the common sense side of things was something to do with experience as well. It's not just. It seems to be. You know. Yes. We look at it because we have that experience to go, well, that's common sense not to do that. I know it's common sense now not to spend all my money and go into a lot of debt, um, even though I probably at a at a conscious level knew that it wasn't common sense you know, 20 odd years ago, I still did it. The I think the idea though is economies of scale, right? As a kid, you're given you're given money for you're given an allowance, mm. right? And you go, okay. And you go to the candy store and you blow it all. Mm. Okay, you have a great time for like a day. You get a nasty, nasty sugar high. You wake <laughs> up after the sugar, you know, you wake up after the sugar wears off, feeling like crap, fine, whatever. And then you see a toy you want. Mm. 
can't have that because you spent all your money. But yeah. it's kind of the the precursor lesson to, hey, don't spend all your money, you know, later on. It's we learn the, the idea of the highway example is a great one. If you have kids who are playing and one kid tackles another one and the kid goes, ow, that hurt. Mm. <laughs> And look at how fast that car is moving. And that's a lot more solid than my friend. Maybe a little extrapolation here will go a long way. The more we play, the more successful we are as adults because we learn to problem solve. We learn to, especially with our bodies and body awareness is huge. Um, As much as I, you know, as much as I groused as a kid when it was go outside, you know, this is, it's a sunny day. Then, you know, yeah, well, yeah. I'm I'm the first to admit I've got nearly translucent skin. You know I don't tan. I neutralize <laughs> the blue. But uh, the fact is, is that I still kind of got out there, and I, you know, sure did I get did I get hit by poison ivy? Sure, no problem. Did I scrape myself? Yup. Did I, you know? But I learned a certain amount of body control, which still serves me to this day. You know, it's, mm. it's we learn as kids by playing, and I think the more we play, the more even as adults, the more we kind of let our let our minds play with stuff. Um, strangest case of teaching somebody something in in a in a roundabout way. Um, somebody asked me uh, when I was when, when one of the places I was working. Somebody asked me, "How does the stock market work? Like, how do stocks work?" I said, "Okay." I said, "Go on this. Go on this website and go to the, uh, go on this website. Go on that computer and go on this website." And I showed them drug wars, which is a game where you have a limited number of turns to buy low in one area and sell high in another. And you got to kind of learn the prices, but the prices randomize a bit. And but you have classes and whatnot. So I started teaching them, and they were like, "I don't understand." I was like, "Hold on, I want you to play like three, four rounds. Do you get the concept?" They're like, "Yeah." I said, "Stocks are the exact same thing. You buy low, you sell high. Sometimes it doesn't work in your favor. Sometimes it does. The more you have them, the more you know. Every time the price goes up, you." This is how you play the stock market. You play, mm. you play with big stocks. You have big, you have a chance for big losses. But I taught them by using a game called Drug Wars. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> but it was fun. And a manager came by and he goes, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "They were like, what are you doing?" She goes, "Like I'm buying cocaine." <laughs> I was like, "Virtually, virtually." It's like, why would you be doing this? Because it shows how stocks work. <laughs> <laughs> He looked at this and it took him a second, but he was just like, ding, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> like he watched this, you know? It was fun. It was just, it was a blast. But the idea of play can teach, can teach that kind of thing. Yeah, we 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 learn. Play gives us the models by which we model our world. How much of that play, because we linked that play to sports and we've we've kind of moved into that participation trophy area. Oh. And you know wanting everyone to feel special if that's the right word um the people turn up and no matter what you do you get a trophy because you've is how much of that affects the ability when we're talking again people feeling lost lonely and and not having a place in society sometimes the world is not going to give you a trophy just because you turned up I think participation trophies are one of the worst things. It it comes down to the 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 wonderful analogy of a good parent prepares their child for the road. Mm. A bad parent prepares the road for their child. Mm. Yeah, so great analogy. if we don't learn to adapt, and again, this comes down to play. This comes down to the the the, the parents who are massively overprotective like massively overprotective, they they don't give their child the, the, the room to figure things out for themselves. Uh, one thing I, I, I've actually thanked my parents. My parents worked, both of them. I had time when I came home from school. I was a latchkey kid. I would open the door. I would come. I had a small list of chores. I would do my chores. I would do some of my homework. Uh, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't the perfect student. I freely admit that. Um, and... But the fact is, is that I had a computer and that was my mom spent one of her Christmas bonuses on a computer and I would play with it. But to the point where I learned how to take it apart and, you know, understand how everything worked and Mm. I would get into it and I started upgrading it myself. And all of a sudden it was it became a skill set. But I've actually turned to my parents and thanked them for saying, thank you. Thank you for leaving me alone. 
with enough time to start figuring some stuff out for myself or figuring out some of the world. One of my chores would be, can you bake a cake for tonight's dinner, you know, or for, for the, you know, for dessert for the next three nights? Sure. Were there times I screwed it up? Yup. Mm. Don't do, you know, left the egg out. Oh, bad cake. Don't do that. <laughs> it wasn't an expensive mistake and it was a worthwhile, it was worthwhile learning. It, it was yeah. a form of play. So uh, how much, yeah. So from that perspective and where does that fit in where you made those mistakes? Cause we, we talk about failure being important. I had that with my son when he was doing karate, he wasn't doing the study. I noticed he wasn't doing rather than yell at him that he needs to do the study. I said, you're going to fail. I'm going to let you fail. Um, and he went to do the grading. It was one of his earlier gradings. Everyone else passed and went up. He didn't. He didn't get it. And I knew because I talked to the sensei beforehand what was going to happen. Then as we were leaving, I said, how did that feel? He didn't like it. He didn't let that happen again. Um, how much of that do we need to have that, that you know, embrace failure? Not No, we don't aim to fail, but chances oh, are yeah. in any in any circumstance, you are going to, you know, especially if you're learning something new, you have beginners suck. You're going to not be good at it when you first start doing something, and and that's okay. How much of it is that? I I, I really think that we we have to get away from the culture of coddling everything. And like, here's the idea: um, you, you get hurt once, right? Mm. And then you, naturally, we are fearful of hurting ourselves again, depending on how bad it was, right? Um, but people who never try and who just fear getting hurt, the pain is so much more when you do because you have no experience aside from mm. that to extrapolate from. So we fear we, well, I don't want to, you know, you brush the cat, it scratches you. Yeah, it hurts. It sucks. So what do you do? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't brush the cat. I don't touch it. Or, you know, like I, 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 I limit my interaction. no. No, no, that's not good for you. It's not good for the cat. You, yes, it scratched you. It sucks. You, you know, polysporin, put a bandage on, you know, move on. But fine, if you want to glove up or something, great. I'm not saying you have to get a falconer's glove. It's a little <laughs> over the top. But, you know, yeah, sure, you you jump in, you get back in there, you, you, you learn. You learn. And it, that's, I think that's one of the biggest tricks is that we really have to get in there and, and, you know, we, we have to learn more. We have to play more. And even if play, you know, like with karate, we, it's fine to fail. Um, one of the complaints, actually, because we were talking about video games, one of the complaints in the video game industry is there is this kind of no fail now, where mm. before, when you ran out of lives, you had to start the game over. Not, not From the beginning. Not, <laughs> right, not the beginning of the level, not, not the last checkpoint. No, no. Yeah. The set the way set the way back machine set the way back machine Mr. Peabody right I had the re-release of the Atari video the, the 2600 which you know I'm really dating myself now um but yeah my friend had a, a version of that and and we were at at his place with my son and we we're playing it and yeah exactly that is like your three lives are up gotta start from the be very beginnings like what <laughs> it's like yeah that's how we did it you don't respawn where you left off <laughs> right Whereas now a lot of the games, and it, the thing is, is again, this is kind of preparing. This is kind of preparing the road for us, and it, it's a matter. Of, well, it doesn't matter what you do; you're not going to fail. And there are games that have incorporated that mechanic very cleverly, or mm. games like roguelikes, where you're supposed to fail. Like you are, not, I don't care how good you are, you are, you will fail in your first playthrough. You will mm. die. Yeah, die a lot, but you will get incrementally better. You will get little upgrades, of kids that stay with you. And, uh, that's interesting. That's more failure is not. We we've learned to fear failure as well, right? School, mm. you failed the test. Fail, just the word fail. It's like you know, we we big we red mark too. We quail at it. You yes. know, <laughs> it's like no, no, no. Ah, ah. It's okay to fail, mm. like you mentioned that that, that self assurance where it's okay. I failed. It's not the end of the world. What's the worst that happens? You have to take the test again. Yeah. Or you have to, right? Mm. Sure, it doesn't feel good, but it makes you more resilient. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and that's, the, I mean, re resilient, what you're talking about there. Is that part of, again, that when we're talking about people lost, lonely, not feeling a, um, that they have a place in the world, is that part of having that resilience to go, okay, I just need to 
go out there and do it. Yeah, I might meet some people. They might not be into my what we we talk about your freak flag fly stuff. Um, they might not have you know the same thing, but there are people out there, and I just need to be resilient enough to go out and and give it another go. It, I think it's again. It, it, I agree. I say yes. What you just said, yes. It's that. Um, it's that separating yourself from the outcome, the idea mm. that every date must be a successful date. Mm. No, no, every, you don't have to win at every date. Mm. It, you have to you have to go on enough dates to find the people with whom that date is a win. That mm. that it is a win, not that you're winning at it. That it is a win for both of you. Yeah, right. It's not about winning every encounter. It's about the encounters that. That really yield those those amazing moments. Uh, life is not about the number of breaths you take, but the number of moments to take your breath away. <laughs> I love that. So that I love that one. Yeah. Great one. So um, for me, it's that's a that's a big one. It's the yes, you have to have that resilience. Go out, meet people, get get out of your comfort zone. And sometimes we need sometimes we need some help. Hmm. Sometimes we need a friend with a crowbar. <laughs> there are those people. <laughs> but, I'm one of those friends for some of my friends. It's like, stop doing that. That's stupid. <laughs> or, or at least it's like, dude, you haven't been out in two weeks. Yeah. We're going for drinks. We're going to walk in the park. We're going to do something outside of your status quo. Just join me i'm not asking you to i'm not asking you to commit to two weeks uh, two week cruise here <laughs> <We're> <laughs> 30 minutes <laughs> Let, let's go for a walk 30 minutes you i know? love that we've talked for a while if you were to to sum it up um put in a nutshell what is manly how would you do that Ooh. i think what is manly I would have to say that for me, Manly is um, coming to find that strength within yourself, that inner peace, because what it used to be, the traditional roles, everything that we've been told, all the the five percent that are, you know, the five percent on either extreme, they're blasting them, you know, blasting all this stuff at us. Mm. It's finding what's right for you it's simplifying it down finding what works for you and it doesn't have to work for everybody you will find your people but you 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 have to find yourself you have to you have to find what's comfortable for you you have to find that inner peace to go i am okay where i am with who i am and then we can build off that whether you want to be more feminine i don't care if if, if that's if that's you want to become a drag queen, great. That's fine. If that's, you know what, you just, if you want to be an amateur sports commentator, awesome. Whatever moves you, whatever, but engage with the world. Because the more you do that, the more the world engages with you. And that, that, my good sir, is manly. I love that. Richard, it has been so wonderful chatting with you. So much useful information. I'm going to have to go back and digest this one a, a few times to to pull it all out of, of all the knowledge out of that. But thank you for taking the time. I would love to catch up again in the future and have some more chats. But Richard, really appreciate you making the time to share your thoughts on, on what is manly. Well, Damien, thank you for the opportunity and I would love to chat again. This would be great. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.